cash because we had we could have the casualties in Japan and on an operating table five days after injury, uh -huh. which was time enough to uh, close most of their wounds, which had been debrided originally at the time of, of injury in Vietnam. So they were stabilized for about 36 hours and then flown to us. And uh, we routinely anesthetized them and undid their dressings the next day and uh, were able to close most of the wounds. Then, of course, we got post-operative complications uh, or more extensive injuries were also sent at, at an appropriate time. But they were staged in Japan before being sent back to the United States. And, and so what, hap what happened next in, in, in your career then? Then I uh, was fortunate enough to come back to San Francisco to do my thoracic, my chest surgery residency at Letterman Hospital. Uh -huh. And I stayed on the staff at Letterman for two more years. So, and then I had an opportunity to get out of the army. And by that time, frankly, I was uh, disillusioned by the Vietnam War. Oh, really? And, um, uh, could muster very little enthusiasm. I had a lot of enthusiasm for the people I was taking care of, but uh -huh. uh, the fact that we were getting draftees sent back to us. Uh, in a steady stream from a war I considered unnecessary. Uh, disenchanted me. Uh huh. And, and, but anyway, after you finished your thoracic uh, residency, then? I spent, as I say, two years on the staff here at Letterman. And mm -hmm. I, then I got out of the Army and uh, entered private practice uh, here in San Francisco. And what year is that? 71. Okay. And what, and, and what happened since 71? Well, I, I had a a, a wonderful career practicing thoracic surgery uh, here in San Francisco. I retired from full-time practice in, uh, I guess, 1996 or so. And so. How many years is that? Let's see, 71, 96, 81, 91. 25 years. 25. It, but that was after 13 years in the Army. Oh! <laughs> so it was a total of 38 years altogether. <laughs> You haven't worked hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, after semi-retiring, I uh, assisted at cardiac surgery for another four years until I, I quit in 2000. Uh-huh. And Oh, you I, did? You, you totally retired from your thoracic practice? Uh, totally retired from the active practice of surgery, yeah. I mean, you still have some kind of management role in the... In well, what the, I'm uh, doing now is a labor of love, really. I'm interviewing patients in California who are requesting uh, permission or authorization to use cannabis medically. Oh. Okay. But before we get into that, Tom, something I want to, I want to uh, hear a little bit from you about is, uh, you know, you've heard the expression that sometimes hard to, to uh, tell the forest for the trees. And, and uh, um, from your observations of, uh, it's been about five or six years or something since we met and, and I became aware of your uh, interest and involvement with the war on drugs. And uh, I'm just curious uh, what you, what your kind of, the big picture is. I mean, you know, as, as a physician, as two physicians together here, uh, I mean, it's it's been kind of remarkable to me that uh, that there hasn't been more of a physician voice in this whole thing that's going on. It's kind of like it's a, it's a, something that was a, a concept born of the legal profession, by the legal profession, and, and for the legal profession. Uh, at the same time, the movement, normal and so forth, there's nothing that gives the legal profession more credibility, in, in a sense, is, is, is the people, uh, the attorneys who are active in, in att trying to make change. But uh, what I'm saying is that, like, on the individual small issue, somebody that's been busted somewhere that may go to jail, I, um, if the uh, legal people were, or in, in any court case, they would... Uh, the, the attorneys would get the best expert witness that they could possibly find to represent, you know, their case. But when it 
so, but that's in a specific case. But when, in regards to the general health of society, and uh, so to speak, a way of life, so to speak, uh, it seems like the the individuals within the movement, rather than drawing from the kingpins of medicine, so to speak, the cardiovascular surgeons, um, would uh, rather, uh, it's what you said, it's like physicians are marginalized somehow, and, and instead it's, it's uh, nothing against chiropractors and, and holistic, whatever you know, broad term that is, but what, what's going on here? Well, I think that physicians have been scared out of the drug war. Uh, actually, it began a long time ago when uh, the Harrison Act was passed back in 1914, not to be too dry and academic, uh, but I'm doing that anyway. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, the idea was that they were using the physicians to record a, a small tax was paid on every narcotic transaction. Uh -huh. overseen by the physician, in other words, his prescription. So it's just a way to keep track of who was using and not to interfere in any way. Well, a few years later they began prosecuting those doctors who were signing lots of prescriptions and uh, that was the nose of the camel coming under the tent. And The early Supreme Court cases all involved doctors right from 1915 through 1925. And of course, uh, by carefully choosing their opposition, uh, the government won case after case and established their right to essentially usurp this practice of this part of practice from physicians. And that, that's and the, the war on drugs that Nixon declared in '72 is just an intensification of the same idea. Just sort of, nothing ch changed. It was just more money and a few different laws to intensify the, the prosecution of drug users. The, the drug war on drugs shifted a lot from physicians in the beginning to patients or to, to users or to addicts later on. I mean, actually, your involvement was more, uh, more a matter of the war on drugs in, in general, the, the uh, harmful effects, if you will, of the war on drugs uh, as opposed to marijuana specifically. Um, and, uh, uh, right, I came on board pretty much as a, a theoretical purist, and I thought that all prohibition was silly, and I didn't really differentiate much between marijuana and heroin, although the public did, uh, and still does, of course. But uh, you're right, I've, I've moved from the theoretical back into the uh, personal, and the reason for that is California's Proposition 215 and what I perceive finally is a need for physicians who are willing to stick their neck out and write recommendations. And so that's what you've, you've gotten into yourself here? I started doing it gradually last year on the request of you know friends and acquaintances, but uh, starting in November I uh, made myself available to some of the local so-called buyer's clubs. Uh -huh. well, what's, what's been your experience with this? Well, there's a huge demand uh, which has been met because most physicians are unwilling to write these recommendations and there are relatively few physicians who will do it. Write a prescription for, for marijuana, literally? It's not, technically, it's not a prescription. That's an important differentiation. It's a recommendation. That's the way the, the initiative was written. So that mm -hmm. the doctor isn't technically prescribing a medicine, and the patient's taking it with the doctor's advice. Now it's sort of a, the lawyers would call a distinction without a difference. But uh -huh. The distinction is, is regarded as important. What it involves really is taking a very detailed history from the patient, looking at any x-rays or records that he has to support his claims and then deciding on an individual basis uh, if the patient under the terms of the law could be helped uh -huh. by the use of uh, cannabis. And what, and what you're been, I mean, what kind of conditions have you been, been finding uh, cannabis uh, helpful for? Well, as you well know, cannabis, the hemp plant 
provide so many functions.